Hello, this is Sheila Bender, and you are listening to In Conversation, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life. Today, we are talking to Sayantani Dasgupta, who is an essayist, a short story writer, and the author of Fire Girl, Essays on India, America, and the In-Between, and also of the chapbook, The House of Nails, Memories of a New Delhi Childhood. Sayantani lives now in Idaho, where she teaches. She was born in Calcutta and raised in New Delhi. She received a B.A. in History from St. Stephen's College in Delhi, an M.A. in Medieval History from J.N.U. in New Delhi, and an M.F.A. in Creative Writing from the University of Idaho. She has lived in the United States since 2006. Her publications have won a Pushcart Prize special mention, Du Cool Magazine's 2016 Prize for Creative Nonfiction. Her essay, Oscillation, was a finalist for Phoebe Magazine's 2014 Creative Nonfiction Contest, which was judged by Cheryl Strait. Other honors include a Centrum Fellowship, an Artsmith Scholarship, and a Study Abroad Research Grant. Her research interests include creative nonfiction, literary fiction, South Asian history and literature, Indian cinema, world religions, fairy tales, folklore, and mythology. Sayantani also edits nonfiction for the Seattle-based print journal Crab Creek Review. She is currently at work on two novels and a collection of short stories. Sayantani, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for having me. You have a very impressive list of research interests, and I think perhaps to be expected from a writer. I hope that we get to discussing how some of those influence your writing. First of all, where do you teach in Idaho, and what classes do you teach? I teach at the University of Idaho, which is where I came as a student myself and then stayed on to teach. It's been an amazing experience. I mostly teach classes for the English department. So classes on creative nonfiction and South Asian literature, etc. But because I also have a master's degree in history, I have taught some classes for the history department and I've taught some interdisciplinary classes on things like globalization and world religions and those sorts of things. And it's been fun to sort of play around with my interests and be able to design courses that help me talk about my interests to a larger group of people. Absolutely. And what important subjects right now. I think people are so undereducated about global religions and the history of the <laughs> world. When I read your essays in your newly released, as of this summer, collection Fire Girl, Essays on India, America, and the In-Between, I am so struck by how timely they are, as our national discussion here in the U.S. and abroad centers so much on immigrants, from not wanting them to how to Indeed. help them acculturate to their new homelands. And I'm wondering, how were your essays born from your experience of coming to live in the U.S. after growing up and going to college and graduate school in India? You know, Sheila, before I came to the U.S., I thought I understood the U.S. a little bit because my father had traveled here several times, had come back home with gifts and stories. And of course, in this day and age, America's cultural influence is something that you just cannot sort of escape or ignore. So given that I had grown up on a healthy diet of Hollywood movies and Beverly Hills 90210 when I was a teenager myself, I thought I kind of had a sense of the country. And it's interesting to me how different my experience of living in Idaho has been because it's truly when you start living in a place that you get to understand its complexities and don't believe everything you see on television, don't necessarily believe everything you read about a place because it's only in sort of the experience of living there and interacting with people on a daily basis that a country or a landscape truly reveals itself. I would not have considered writing any of these essays before I came to the U.S. I didn't know that personal creative nonfiction was even a thing. Creative nonfiction in India meant at that time travel writing or food writing or memoirs by decrepit old politicians particularly the latter category, did not sound interesting at all. So when I came here and I was sort of fascinated and surprised to learn that I could write stories about my growing up experiences or I could write about my school experience, about my friends, about some of the unsavory aspects of growing up in New Delhi, it felt like a huge freedom. And I think because I was so homesick that it offered a really good platform to sort of examine my life, to understand it, to look at other sources in terms of understanding India's history and religion and politics, all of these things. Because when you grow up in a country, you are also exposed to 
education on its own terms. But when you step outside, you are given different lenses to examine what was once very familiar to you. So I think all of these contributed in sort of helping me think about and write about my home country. Well, I really enjoyed the essays in the book Fire Girl. Thank and you. I'm wondering if you could read us an excerpt from one of the early essays in the book called On Telling Stories, where you evoke the feelings of being new to the country and new to the school in the U.S. I will sort of read from middle of the essay, which is, I'm talking about walking into the classroom, walking into an American classroom for the first time and the experience of that. By the time I located the classroom and walked in, I was 20 minutes late. Fifteen students and a professor sat in a circle around two large tables joined together. A few smiled as I entered the room. I was the only non-white person. I wasn't intimidated or scared. It wasn't as if I hadn't interacted with white people before. But those interactions had been in India, limited to conversations with exchange students and international colleagues or a handful of my father's foreign friends. But I did feel like an outsider, the same way I had on my first day of college at St. Stephen's in Delhi. I had looked at my male classmates and walked out of the room, convinced I had made a mistake. For 12 years leading up to that day, I had studied at a Catholic girls-only school. At the professor's request, my classmates began introducing themselves. They listed their names, prior education, hometowns, etc. In India, I had always prided myself in being aware of my surroundings, in my ability to distinguish between accents from various parts of the country, or in terms of picturing someone's hometown, irrespective of how far it was from New Delhi. But here I struggled as I tried locating my classmates' hometowns in my mind. Where was Missoula? Was Nebraska a city or a state? Did Oregon have a coastline? I excused my ignorance, and in my mind, I smudged the locations into one big glob. It was all America, wasn't it? How different could it be? I dismissed the lens and experiences of my classmates' local travel. Surely, since I had covered the longest geographical distance to be here, I had the most important story to tell. Since I was the person of color from a third world country, I had the most at stake. I have a feeling, actually I've read the essay, that you're going to learn that everybody has a story to tell. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Another essay in that book that touched me very deeply was the one about your grandfather's death and his life called My Grandfather's Red Chair. And I was hoping that perhaps you could read an excerpt from that essay as well. Absolutely. I'll read from the start of the essay. My grandfather's red chair. One of my earliest memories of my grandfather is the two of us sitting side by side in identical red chairs in the drawing room of his home in Calcutta. I do not remember the first conversation we ever had, but I imagine we held hands, a system we followed everywhere, while taking evening walks in the neighborhood or an overnight bus ride to the beach or sitting through tedious hours of someone's wedding. In spite of the others who were with us, my parents, my grandmother, or my brother, he and I always sat together, and we always, always held hands. Which is why the night he passed away, my first reaction was not grief, but an acute sense of betrayal. I screamed at him as I stormed through my apartment in rage, pausing only to punch my laptop keyboard rapidly while I searched for plane tickets from Spokane, Washington, to Calcutta, India. I couldn't log into the travel website because my name, too, is his gift. Signed me, meaning twilight or dusk in Sanskrit, to mark the precise hour of my birth. I raged at him inside my head. How dare you? It's the middle of the week, for heaven's sake. I can't just leave my students in classes and take off for you. How dare you go away without assuring me you have told me every story? Have you really told me every story? Have you told it to me enough number of times so I will remember the detail? What if I forget dates, names, places, or punchlines? What then? It's been more than two years since his death, and I still search for clues, wondering if he said goodbye to me in some subtle way, and I was too busy grading tests or reading BuzzFeed on my phone to notice. A part of me thinks that he should have tried harder and left me an actual message, a final tangible token of his love something more appropriate than a phrase like, I love you, because I love you does not translate well in Bengali. It sounds ridiculous and silly, embarrassing even. Not once in my life did my grandfather ever tell me he loved me. 
It's just not the Bengali way of life. But he showed his love, talking to me like my opinion mattered, even when I was a child, like I was his equal, when he composed nonsensical songs with me when I was four, when we sang them loudly and shamelessly in front of any audience we could find, and when he took me to museums and bookstores, and as I grew older, quizzed me on subjects like politics, religion, literature, and history, demanding that I defend my answers with logic and example, not childish sentimentality. It didn't matter whether his question was about the nature of British rule in India or why I preferred oranges over apples. When someone makes you the nucleus of his life, you find yourself willing and ready to follow him down every rabbit hole. My favorite memory of my grandfather is from the summer I turned seven. My mother and I had just spent several weeks in Calcutta, and on our last day, she and I were at the railway station about to board the train that would bring us back to New Delhi. We were surrounded by grandmothers, aunts and uncles who had come to see us off. Everyone was accounted for except my grandfather. Just as I was beginning to get irritated, he sauntered down the platform, his right hand holding up a neat arrangement of seven books stacked in a pile, bound together with brown twine. He handed them to me as an early birthday present, and I quickly did the math. Seven books for my seven years on this planet. Seven books for the next seven days of the week, seven books for the first seven hours of the train trip, only to be reread again before reaching New Delhi. I abandoned the math when the next few minutes became a blur of hugs, tears, and smiles from everyone. As the train jerked out of the wet rag humidity that is Calcutta and began charging toward the dry, desert-like air of New Delhi, I understood that something incredible had just happened. I had received an extraordinary gift from an extraordinary man. He had taken the time to go to a bookstore and pick seven titles that would entertain not just any seven-year-old girl, but specifically his seven-year-old granddaughter, who did not want to read stories of princesses, cutesy animals, or lost chickens, but of haunted houses, vengeful ghosts, and witches with no feet. In that moment, I knew this was a man who would love me forever. And, of course, you love him forever. Um, yes. What a lovely legacy he gave you. I find that essay very moving, no matter which culture it's from, but the color of uh, Calcutta and the train station and watching him appear there is is lovely, and the humidity and all of that really places me. So thank you so much. You are listening to KPTZ 91.9 FM, Port Townsend. In case you just joined us, you are listening to In Conversation with Sheila Bender, discussions on writing and the writing life. Today, Sheila is talking with frequent visitor to Port Townsend, author Sayantani Dasgupta, about her poetry and creative nonfiction. You've had a new book come out at the same time as Fire Girl called House of Nails from Redbird Press, and you've described it as a chapbook of flash nonfiction essays. Can you tell us a little bit Mm -hmm. about chapbook and flash, and then perhaps read one? Yes. Chapbooks are such delightful beings because they are small, they are handmade, they are definitely labors of love. And I'm just so grateful to Redbird Press for accepting my manuscript. And they did such a beautiful and terrific work because right from the quality of pages to the amount of time and care they took in terms of editing the manuscript and how many times we went back and forth deciding on the cover, they did it with so much respect towards the manuscript that as an author you can only feel a sense of humility and honor that someone is investing so much in your writing. This was a collection of flash nonfiction, meaning each chapter or rather each essay is less than 500 to 600 words. And these are just like little snapshots or little glimpses of my chosen topic, which is my childhood in New Delhi. And the chapbook is called The House of Nails because the first house we lived in, in New Delhi, the tenants before us who lived there had left nails on every every wall, every surface. I don't know why they needed so many nails, what they hung from each of these nails, but there were literally nails coming out of every surface. So when I asked my father one time as he was removing some of these nails from the walls, my dad said, maybe one of these nails, if you pull it out, maybe we'll find a secret tunnel that leads us to someplace magical. <laughs> And as a kid, that was like the most interesting thing I had ever heard about our house. So that stayed with me. And that's where the genesis of the book happened and all these essays. So I'm going to read an essay from this titled Tin Roof Sonata. 
And this is about my parents and how they met. And they had an arranged marriage and uh, got married in 1977. So this essay is um, a little bit about Ma and Baba. Tin Roof Sonata. In 1976, in a middle-class home of Calcutta, a set of parents approached their son to ask if he was ready for marriage. When he said yes, his father, a bureaucrat, drafted a paragraph-long advertisement listing his son's many credentials and dashed it off to the matrimonial section of Ananda Bazar Patrika, the Bengali daily with the largest circulation. His son was 27 years old. An electrical engineer with a secure job in his pocket, he had a promising future ahead. The following Sunday morning, in another middle-class home of Calcutta, the patriarch of the family settled in his favorite armchair to peruse the newspaper. On the little table beside him sat a cup of piping hot tea, a plate of onion fritters, and a pencil with which to circle suitable matches for his 23-year-old daughter, a recent college graduate. In spite of the sons who had come before and after her, she was his favorite, and only the best would do for her. When one particular advertisement caught his eye, he called out to his wife. She set aside the bowl of potatoes she was quartering for the afternoon's mutton curry, and stepped out of the kitchen, wiping her wet hands with the ends of her sari. She waited by the door to keep an eye on the lentil stew bubbling on the stove as he read out the advertisement and asked for her opinion. When he finished, she nodded. Engineers have excellent prospects, she said, and brought him his writing pad. He spent the next hour crafting a carefully worded letter, formal and full of praise of his quiet, studious daughter in response to the advertisement. When the letter reached the boy's family, his father and mother read it several times, so impressed were they by its exquisite penmanship, suggestive of erudition and an impeccable family background. The two fathers exchanged letters, then telephone numbers. A week later, the boy's parents visited the girls. They found her polite and bookish, and she answered their questions with a quietitude they liked. The next time around, her parents went to see the boy, and a few months later, on January 29, 1977, the boy and the girl were married. In all, they had met each other three times. Soon after their wedding, my parents moved to Siliguri, a city in northeast India. Their two-story wooden house was tucked into Himalayan foothills, detached from the bustle and grime of Calcutta by a few hours. The arched windows of the new home offered National Geographic calendar-like views every day. And on especially clear mornings, they could see all the way up to the peak of the Kanchenjunga, the third highest mountain in the world. In Tibetan, Kanchenjunga means the five treasures of snow, gold, silver, gems, grain, and scriptures. To the Sikkimese and Nepalese people, Kanchenjunga is a goddess. When the goddess is pleased, she blesses her people with wealth and prosperity. She fills the fields with crops, saturates the rivers with fish. My mother begins every story of this first home she shared with my father with a memory. The neighbors had a tin roof. It aggravated the slightest sound, and we heard it all. The deafening thud of a cricket ball, the rains wrapping it every monsoon. I imagine the memory of that tin roof wedged my mother's mind like a bookmark. She cannot think of that home without the accompanying music and all its tinkle, clang, beat, and rhythm. I imagine the nervous composition of my parents settling down into a new life, the orchestra of fire and spices as my mother stepped into the kitchen for the first time, equipped only with the knowledge of how to boil rice and fry an egg. I imagine the late-night crescendo of my parents' first fight, the next morning a harmony of forgiveness, and the concert of the raging Himalayan rain that beat down on the tin roof while they lived, ate, and awaited the birth of their child. I'm told they wanted their firstborn to be a daughter. Thank you. I want to ask you about the choice to start in the third person, the man placing the ad, the man reading the newspaper, the wife in the kitchen with the potatoes, and then when the couple is married, moving into the first person, my father, my parents. Right. Did that just happen instinctually, or did you think about it as a choice? I think this particular essay went through many drafts, and it came out of a graduate school uh, writing assignment where we had to write our conception stories. So meaning we had to call up our parents and find out details of how we were conceived. 
as far as I was concerned, I thought it was going to be a super awkward and difficult conversation. My mother was just very chilled and she said, well, your American professors are crazy, obviously, but <laughs> here are the details. And she laughed as she told me about where they lived at that time and uh, what they could see from the bedroom window, so on and so forth. This essay was very awkward to write in the beginning, but it went through many drafts and it went through many changes. So there were times when this was a much longer piece and everything was in the third person. There were times when it was shorter and it was in first person. So after several attempts, it just felt like a good decision to club a couple of versions together and see where that takes me. And then it fit neatly into what I was hoping to achieve with the chapbook. So it became one of the chapters. I think it's very effective. And one of the things I also very much enjoy is the domesticity, both uh, in the when you're writing in the third person, the newspaper, what's mm-hmm. beside the man who has his pen to circle the ads, what right. his wife is cooking, and this are your grandparents, obviously. Then it carries through with your mother who marries and hardly knows how to cook anything. She's a bookish person. So all those details of home really create a wonderful thread and place me there in, a, in an environment that both feels strange to me and completely familiar. So I think you really oh, achieved something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It'll be fun to read the rest of these. And again, that's from Redbird Press, and it's called House of Nails. And then we haven't mentioned the fact that Fire Girl, Essays on India, America, and the In-Between was actually published by Two Sylvia's Press, which is in Kingston, Washington, not, right. not very far from Port Townsend. So that leads me to wanting to introduce the idea that you come to Centrum, you, you have had a scholarship there, but you continue to come, and now you're teaching for the program. So yes. You'll be here in the summer. That's right. Tell us about Uh, it. I first came to Centrum in 2008 when I was in grad school myself and I won a fellowship to come and study there for a week. And it was incredible. I think it was one of those life-changing moments for me, right? From how amazingly gorgeous Port Townsend is to the Fort Warden campus to how wonderful and welcoming everyone at the conference was. I just cannot tell you the impact that one week had on my life because the fact that you could just immerse yourself so completely in a landscape with people who are as passionate about reading and writing and words and supporting artists, it was incredible. So since then, I have come back almost every year. I was a student at first year, and I think soon after that, maybe within the next couple of years, I started teaching, and it started with one afternoon workshop, and then it graduated to multiple afternoon workshops. And next year, I will be teaching one of the morning workshops, where I will be leading two and a half hour workshops every morning. And this will be straight up creative nonfiction. And each day, I think I'm going to teach a different kind of essay, so a braided essay or a list essay, so on and so forth. So I'm really looking forward to this because the opportunity to, again, immerse myself in the craft of nonfiction with however number of people sign up for my class, but it will be just such an amazing journey, I think, to be able to work on new essays every day and to read each other's work and um, have hopefully amazing discussions. So I'm really excited for the summer of 2017 and what will be my, I think, seventh time at Port Townsend. The class sounds wonderful, and the Thank way you imagine organizing it is very inviting. Perhaps people listening to the show will think about enrolling this summer. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. As a teacher, I, I want to ask you what your favorite moments are in helping someone write well. I think when um, I'm teaching undergrads, I tell them that I'm not that much interested in the perfection of the essay. And I think that's an important thing to hear because at that stage of your life, you are just so invested in getting the right grades. So you are just trying to figure out what essay I need to write so that this can impress my professor and I can get an A or something. So I tell them that I'm not that interested in the perfection or the perfect execution of the essay. I'm interested in the content of it. And by the content of it, I mean, I want them to reach a point where they can write about perhaps difficult subjects or hard subjects without fear or shame or embarrassment, where they are comfortable. And by difficult subject, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be a subject of trauma or they have to relive something that was incredibly hard or 
left a lifelong scar. But even the simplest of things can be really hard to write about sometimes. How do you make sense of the fact that you are, say, a native of such and such city? Or how do you make sense of the fact that maybe you are 20 and you have never traveled out of state? So, I mean, there could be so many difficult subjects depending on who you are. And I just want my students to reach a point where the act of writing comes easily. And it's not such a difficult thing to think, what am I going to write on today? Or or the fact that they can see that anything under the sun can lead to a really good, meaningful, rich, meaty essay. It's also really rewarding for me when they discover a writer that they really love and whose writing they want to read for the rest of their lives. So a few years ago, I had a student who was uh, an athlete and on the first day of class, he was very emphatic about how he did not enjoy reading at all. By the end of the semester, he had read one of Rebecca Solnit's essays in my class and he was completely in love and he went ahead and bought all her books and just couldn't stop reading her work. And I feel that is such a huge moment for me as a teacher that I made someone fall in love with one author and Maybe this is the start of an enormous journey of reading. So for me, those are some of the most rewarding aspects of being a teacher. Absolutely. And that leads to the question of who are your influences in literature? I think my number one person is Jhumpa Lahiri, who writes the most perfect sentences. I have read the namesake, I think, 500 times in my life, and I still have 500 more times to read it. <laughs> well, um, we do know I you're also... a fast reader since you were seven, but that is <laughs> astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> I also love Elizabeth Trout's work so much, and again, her construction of sentences is just so perfect. I have a bunch of favorites in terms of uh, when it comes to writing with humor. I love the writing of Bill Bryson. Mohsin Hamid, Arvind Adiga, all of these people write with such humor. And at the same time, they are not afraid to really look at humanity, warts and problems and everything. I have recently discovered the writing of Cy Montgomery, whose book, The Soul of an Octopus, has become one of my favorites. And I've been recommending that book to everyone. Uh, as I could learn how to write research as effortlessly as Cy Montgomery or Nathaniel Philbrick, that would be amazing because these are all such stunning writers and their work reads effortlessly. You know that it's been like decades of work that's gone into reaching this level of finesse. It's exciting to listen to you speak because you have such passion for writing and for writers and for <laughs> helping people write. And I'm so happy that you'll be back here in Port Townsend very soon. Will you be giving a reading during Centrum? I think so. I'm not sure yet. If it works out in every which way, I would be happy to, of course, yes. Well, I'm hopeful that they will schedule you for a reading, and those readings are typically open to the public here. So I hope that many of our listeners get an opportunity to hear you read longer than we were able to do during our conversation today. <laughs> so I want to thank you so much, Sayantani, for being with us and for sharing your passions and your background. And I think that anyone listening to you will be encouraged both to write and to read. So thank you so very much. Thank you. This was such a joy to talk to you today. In Conversation is produced by Sheila Bender and edited by Charlie Fleischman. 